Let's take a look at the cosmological argument first. That's the argument we're going to talk about tonight. And many say this is the argument that points to the big bang. <gasps> You're going, uh, Frank, you know we're in a church here. We're Christians. We don't believe in the big bang. You guys don't believe in the big bang? I believe in the big bang. I just know who banged it. <laughs> you see, the evidence for the big bang is quite good. That the universe and time itself had a beginning at some point in the distant past. In fact, it's so good, we even have atheistic scientists admitting it. Stephen Hawking said almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. For those of you who don't know, Stephen Hawking is probably the world's most well-known physicist. And he's a modern medical miracle, because about 40 years ago, he was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease, which normally kills people in about a year or two. He's still alive today. He can only speak through a synthesizer. He can barely move his eyelids. But he's one of the most brilliant minds in, philosophy, in, in, in physics. He's not a believer, but he admits this. Alexander Vilenkin, a Russian cosmologist, put it this way. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is now no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. He's saying there has to be a beginning. And he's a believer in what... Uh, many call the multi-universe theory, that we're not the only universe out there, that there are many universes. There's no evidence for this, but he believes it. Yet even Vilenkin says, even if there is a multiverse, there are many universes outside of this one other than ours, there has to be an absolute beginning to the whole show. There's an absolute beginning, there has to be an absolute beginner. Now what's the evidence that this universe had a beginning? I'm going to give you an acronym, and this is all from chapter 3 of the book. The acronym is SURGE, S-U-R-G-E, and each one of these letters stand for a different line of scientific evidence that the universe had a beginning. And we'll just list them here and then go through them very briefly. S stands for the second law of thermodynamics. We'll explain that in a minute. The U stands for the fact that the universe is expanding. The R stands for the radiation afterglow. The G stands for the great galaxy seeds. And E stands for Einstein's theory of general relativity. As I mentioned, we're going to go through each one of these in order. I just want to lay it out before we go. Surge, S-U-R-G-E. This will help you remember it, OK? Let's start with the first, the second law of thermodynamics. It says the universe is running down. It's running out of usable energy. As time goes on, the amount of energy in the universe is decreasing. All scientists know that one day that sun up there is going to burn out. There's only so many hydrogen atoms in it. Now, two weeks ago, it was so cold here, I thought it did burn out. I don't know if you remember that. But no, it's still burning up there. Now you say, well, how does this show the universe had a beginning? That because the sun's going to burn out, how, how does that show the universe had a beginning? Well, let's look at it this way. Suppose I had took a flashlight, and I turned a flashlight on and put it on this little table right here, and uh, tomorrow we were to come back in the room. We left it turned on overnight. What would be the strength of the beam coming out of the flashlight tomorrow? It'd be very weak if not dead. Why? Because there's only so much juice in those batteries, right? Well, you can think of the universe as having batteries. And if we turned on the universe an infinitely long time ago, would we have any juice in the universe right now? Just like if we turned on the flashlight an infinitely long time ago, would there be any light coming out of there right now? No. So if there is still light coming from the sun, then it must have been created a finite amount of time ago. Because if it had been turned on an infinitely long time ago, we wouldn't even be here. We wouldn't have any sun. This shows the universe had a beginning. If it had a beginning, it had a beginner. Second law of thermodynamics is also the law of disorder. Things go to disorder rather than order. Things don't tend to get more ordered as time goes on. They get less ordered. As I'm standing on the stage right here, I'm looking down, and I can see that there are cut marks in the paint. There are scratches in the paint. Why? Second law of thermodynamics. We wear things out. It's why you've got to replace this carpet. It's why you have to paint these walls. It's why you've got to put gas in your car. Second law of thermodynamics even affects us personally. When we get older, the second law of thermodynamics affects us. It gives us dresser disease. That's when our chest falls into our drawers. It'll happen. Watch out. Not now, but later. Now, if the second law of thermodynamics, some of you will never get that one. Don't give me that groans over there, OK? If Christianity is true, Paul says, Romans chapter 8, the creation is in bondage to decay. But when the new heavens and new earth comes, as it says in uh, the end of Revelation, 
The second law of thermodynamics is going to be put out of business. We're never going to run down. We're going to be eternal. But right now, the second law of thermodynamics is showing this universe had a beginning. Now, the U in surge stands for the fact that the universe is expanding. Does anyone know who this guy is right here? He has a telescope named after him right now. That's Edwin Hubble. Back in the 1930s, they thought it was cool to have your picture taken with a pipe. Okay? Hubble's telescope, as you know, is now circling our planet, giving us tremendous pictures. But back in 1929, Hubble was looking, at, looking through the uh, telescope at the Mount Wilson Observatory, this 100-inch telescope, which is in Pasadena, California, high up in the hills. And Hubble was looking out this telescope, and he noticed when he looked at the galaxies out there that they were all moving away from us. How did he know this? Because there was a red shift in the light, coming from the light. And that red shift told him that the galaxies were racing away from us. If the, if the galaxies looked blue, they'd be coming to us, but they were all moving away. So Hubble deduced, if we could watch the universe in reverse, in other words, we could watch time in reverse, we could reverse time and see it, see everything come in reverse, we would see all those galaxies, all those stars collapse back to a point, not the size of a basketball, not the size of a pinhead, but mathematically it would collapse back ultimately to nothing. So once there was nothing and then bang, the entire space-time continuum leapt into existence. That has implications we'll talk about in a minute. Hold on to Hubble, we're going to come back to him. Good scientific theories predict future discoveries. And scientists thought if the universe did explode into being out of nothing, and it did so in a great explosion, there should be remnant heat from the explosion still out there. Then two scientists working at Bell Labs in Homedale, New Jersey, discovered it by accident. These two guys right here. These guys, their names, Penzias and Wilson. Right here, that's Robert Wilson on the left, and that's Arno Penzias on the right. They discovered the remnant heat from the initial Big Bang explosion by accident, by means of that antenna right behind them. They won Nobel Prizes for this discovery in 1978. That's a picture of it. You say, what is the background radiation? You ever watching TV at night with the lights out? What do you see when you turn off the TV? You see a glow coming off the TV, right? That's radiation afterglow. That's remnant heat coming off the TV. Well, there's remnant heat coming off the universe. It's still out there. The universe is still cooling off. This heat is just a couple of degrees above absolute zero, but these guys discovered it. When this discovery was made, even an agnostic astronomer, a guy who didn't know if there's a god or not, his name is Robert Jastro, who sat in the chair Edwin Hubble sat in at the Mount Wilson Observatory until recently. Jastro said this, when they discovered this radiation afterglow, he said, those who believe that the universe is eternal can no longer believe in that theory. This put the nail in the coffin of what was at that point called the steady state theory, that the universe was static and eternal. If it's static and eternal, it doesn't need a cause. Jastro said, this discovery put that theory to bed. You know what? They weren't done yet. They said, you know what? If this Big Bang cosmology is true, this story of how the universe came into existence out of nothing is true in a great explosion, there should be very fine temperature variations in that radiation afterglow. But they couldn't measure these temperature variations from Earth because there's too much atmospheric interference. So they were going to have to put a satellite up. And in 19, the 80s, they designed a satellite. And they were going to put it up on the space shuttle. But in 1986, the Challenger space shuttle exploded off the launching pad. And the space shuttle program was canceled for a while, so they had no way to get the satellite up. So they redesigned the entire satellite. They made it half its original size. And then they launched it up on a French Titan rocket and put it into orbit in 1989. For three years, this satellite circled the Earth taking measurements of the radiation afterglow. They had to wait three years to announce their findings because the temperature variations were very, very fine. They had to make sure that they weren't measuring something that was other than these temperature variations. For three years, they took readings, and then finally, in 1992, they announced their results. What they found shocked the scientific world. In fact, the leader of the expedition, this man right here, George Smoot, said, we found the machining marks of the creator. 
they found temperature variations that were down to one part in 100,000. In fact, this guy right here said, if you're religious, it's like looking at God. That was the headline in Time Magazine, May 1992. If you're religious, it's like looking at God. Stephen Hawking, the great physicist I mentioned earlier, said, this is the scientific discovery of the century, if not all time. And these temperature variations, according to the theory, allowed the galaxies to form in the early universe so we could be here. Now, you know, a lot of people, when you go to school, they want to talk about Darwinism, as if Darwinism puts God out of business. Even if Darwinism were true, and I don't think it is. In fact, I think there's many problems with the Darwinistic theory from the goo to you via the zoo. I don't think that's true. But even if it were 100% true, you don't just need a designer to start life. You need a designer at the very beginning of the universe. That if you were to change these temperature variations by an imperceptible amount, we wouldn't even be here. In other words, the universe is designed from the very beginning. The Big Bang was not a chaotic explosion where junk goes everywhere. No, it was a very fine-tuned, precise, shepherded creation. So even if Darwinism is true, you still need a designer. The E in, in CERD stands for Einstein. And Einstein's theory of general relativity, which he knew back in 1917, says that space, time, and matter are co-relative, that you can't have one without the other, that space, time, and matter came into existence together. Once there was no space, once there was no time, once there was no matter, and then bang, it all leapt into existence out of absolutely nothing. What's nothing? Aristotle had a good definition of nothing. He said, nothing is what rocks dream about. That's nothing. No thing, no matter, no space, no time. Nothing spatial physical or temporal. In fact, Einstein didn't like this when he first discovered it. You know what he did? He put a cosmological constant into his equations. What's a cosmological constant? It's a fudge factor into his general relativity equations to make the equation turn out so the universe is static and eternal rather than having a beginning and expanding. And he did this in 1917. Well, some other mathematicians in the 1920s were looking at Einstein's equations going, Al, you seem to have an algebraic error in here. You know what the great Einstein did in order, to, in order to avoid an absolute beginning to the universe? The great Einstein divided by zero. Now, what are you, ter yeah, what are you told in third grade? Divide Never divide by zero. You can go straight to hell for dividing by zero. Don't divide by zero. You know, Einstein did that. You know why? Because he didn't like where his equations were leading. Where were they leading? To God. He didn't like that. Then in 1929, Hubble discovered the expanding universe. And he called Einstein up and he said, Al, re you remember what you calculated in your general relativity equations back in 1917? I am observing what you calculated mathematically. Why don't you come out to Mount Wilson and you can look through my telescope and see the expanding universe for yourself. So in 1931, Einstein went out to Mount Wilson and he looked through Hubble's telescope. In fact, who's that right behind him? That's Hubble. See the pipe? Einstein saw the red shift in the light. He got off the telescope, and at some point later, he said the cosmological constant was the greatest mistake in my professional life. The universe did have a beginning. He said, all I'm interested now is finding the mind of God. The rest are details. Now, Einstein was not a Christian. Einstein denied being an atheist. He also denied being a pantheist. So nobody really knows what Einstein personally believed, but his equation showed that there is a spaceless, timeless, immaterial beginning or beginner to this universe. In fact, this theory has been shown so accurate to more than five decimal points that it's virtually certain that he's right. In fact, if Einstein were here today and you were to say, Al, I don't think the universe had a beginning, you know what he'd probably do? He'd probably do this, because it did. Now, this theory has been proven so accurate, and all this evidence is proven so accurate, that this guy, Robert Jastrow, the guy I mentioned earlier, who was an agnostic, didn't know if there was a God or not, he said, the astronomical evidence leads to a biblical view of the origin of the world. The essential element in the astronomical and biblical accounts of Genesis is the same. Here's what Jastrow later said. He said, astronomers now found they painted themselves into a corner. 
because they have proven by their own methods that the world began abruptly in an act of creation to which you can trace the seeds of every star, every planet, every living thing in this cosmos and on the earth, and they have found that all this has happened as a product of forces they cannot hope to discover. That there are what I or anyone else would call supernatural forces at work is now, I think, a scientifically proven fact. 